This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 82, for broadcast on the 8th of November, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, the new Gaia data showing stars stick in families, this week's rare transit of Mercury, and what could be the solar system's smallest dwarf planet. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New data shows that newborn stars don't simply drift away from their stellar nurseries, but rather stick together in long-lasting string-like groups. The findings by the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft are painting a new picture of the early years of a star's life. Exploring the distribution and past history of the starry residents of our galaxy is especially challenging, as it requires astronomers to determine the ages of stars. Now that's not an easy thing, because average stars of similar mass but different ages look very much alike. So to figure out when a star formed, astronomers instead look at populations of stars thought to have formed at the same time. But knowing which stars are siblings poses yet another challenge, as most stars don't hang out in their stellar nurseries for very long. The study's lead author, Marina Kunkel from Western Washington University, says in order to identify which stars formed together, her team looked for stars moving together through the galaxy because a cluster of stars formed in the same molecular gas and dust cloud would tend to move together in a similar way. Astronomers have already identified so-called co-moving star groups near our solar system, but observations by Gaia enabled them to identify many more such stellar streams spread right across the galaxy. The authors used data from Gaia to trace the structure and star formation activity of a large patch of space surrounding the Milky Way, and then to explore how this has changed over time. Gaia's second data release last year provided the motions and positions of more than a billion stars with unprecedented precision. Relying on machine learning algorithms, the analysis of the Gaia data uncovered nearly 2,000 previously unidentified star clusters and co-moving groups of stars, all within 3,000 light years of the Sun. That's roughly 750 times the distance to Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the Sun. The study also determined the ages for hundreds of thousands of stars, making it possible to track stellar families and uncover their arrangements. The authors found that about half these stars are in long string-like configurations that mirror features present within their stellar nurseries. And that's interesting, because it was originally thought that most young stars would leave their birth sites within just a few million years after their formation, completely losing all ties with their points of origin. But it seems stars can stay close to their siblings for billions of years. The strings also appear to be oriented in particular ways with respect to the galaxy's spiral arms, something that depends on the ages of the stars within the string. Now, this was especially evident for the younger strings, comprising stars younger than 100 million years, which tend to be oriented at right angles to the spiral arm nearest to our solar system. The authors now suspect that the older strings of stars must also have been perpendicular to the spiral arms that existed when these stars formed, which have now been reshuffled over the past billion years. The proximity and orientation of the youngest strings in the Milky Way's present-day spiral arms shows that the older strings are an important fossil record of the galaxy's spiral structure. The actual nature of the spiral arms is still very much in debate, with the final verdict on whether they're stable or dynamic structures nowhere near settled. Studying these older strings will therefore help astronomers understand if the spiral arms are mostly static, or if they move or even dissipate and reform over the course of hundreds of millions of years, roughly the time it takes our Sun to orbit a couple of times around the galactic centre. Gaia was launched in 2013, and is on a mission to chart a three-dimensional map of our Milky Way galaxy, pinpointing the locations, motions and dynamics of roughly 1% of the galaxy's stars. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, a rare image of an upward shooting bolt of lightning called a gigantic jet. And later in the science report, a new study exposes just how the petrochemical multinationals have denied the science of climate change. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Sky watchers are in for a treat this month with the transit of Mercury occurring on Remembrance Day, November the 11th, as the tiny innermost ward of our solar system crosses the face of the Sun as seen from Earth. 
It's a rare event that only happens 13 times a century. Joining us now with the details is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, Jonathan Nally. You don't get to see these every year. It's called a transit of Mercury. What that simply means is Mercury is one of the inner planets, of course. It's, it's the closest one to the sun. So sometimes the orbits line up so that if, if we look from here on Earth towards the sun, Mercury, will, Mercury trundling along in its orbit will cross the face of the sun. It's like a mini eclipse, but Mercury is so tiny compared to the sun, of course, that it doesn't block out the the whole solar disk. It just looks like a little tiny black disk. Now, before we get into when and where you can see it, uh, we obviously have to give the standard uh, solar observing advice, whether it's a solar eclipse of any kind or a transit of Mercury. You must use safe solar viewing techniques, which basically means none of these urban urban myths about yeah, using welding glasses or exposed film or looking through a CD or anything like that. Do not risk it. Um, the, the, you know, if you stare at the sun, you're going to damage your eyes. And if you try and look through a telescope or something at the sun or even binoculars, you will blind yourself, but you won't know straight away. You, you won't think you've blinded yourself. You think, oh, I can still look around, everything's fine. But by the next day, your vision will have gone and you'll have the most almighty headache and you'll be blind. That's it. So don't do that. There are safe ways to observe things on the sun. There are some telescopes you can buy, special solar telescopes that have got special solar filters built in. You can't take them off. So uh, they are perfectly fine to look at the sun with. Maybe you might know someone who has one or a local observatory might have one. You can also buy um, loose or, or, or you know, separate filters that you can attach to normal telescopes, special solar filters. And, of course, there's also just the projection method. We did that for the transit of Venus a couple of years ago. Yeah, look, the projection method is perfectly fine and it's perfectly safe. You can use a couple of bits of cardboard and make basically a pinhole camera. You get one piece of cardboard, put a little hole in the middle of it, and then you hold that piece of cardboard sort of face on towards the sun and then put the other piece of cardboard behind it, away from the sun. The sunlight will, will go through that little hole in the first bit of cardboard and then it will expand outwards and then it will reach the second bit of cardboard and you'll see an image of the sun. And you just adjust the distances to get the, the sharpest sort of picture you can and hopefully you should see a tiny little black dot slowly trundle its way across the face of the sun. So you don't look through the little pinhole you just made, you just let the sunlight come through it and project onto a second piece of cardboard. You can also uh, do much the same thing with a telescope or binoculars. You use the telescope or binoculars pointed at the sun and then the image that comes out the back then get a, a piece of white cardboard or some sort of screen that you can use to project the image onto. Now you've got to be careful with that again because if you're pointing a telescope or a binoculars at the sun you don't adjust it by eye, you don't look through it until you see the sun, you just wiggle the telescope around until you see the sunlight coming out the end that you would normally look through. Why did it burn the cardboard? Well, the idea, the idea I was about to say the idea too is that you still need to have a solar filter of some uh, kind over, over right. the front because what will happen is if you don't put a solar filter over the front, even when doing it like that, the telescope, you know, concentrates light. So you'll get sunlight coming in the, the wide end of your telescope and then concentrated down coming out the thin end of the telescope where you would normally look and that can heat up the lenses in the the back end of the telescope the one you look through uh, and they can shatter they can shatter in, in, into pieces and uh, you know they can, they can cause damage there used to be a kind of solar filter that you could screw into the viewing end of a telescope these were supplied up until the 1980s old telescopes and some people might still have these around and if you do what I want you to do is grab this little solar filter that they used to supply and smash it with a hammer because they're really dangerous because those things did tend to shatter uh, you used to put this in the eyepiece end, the bit you look through, and then people would, okay, start looking at the sun using the solar filter, and the intensity of the heat that was being concentrated onto this little solar filter at the, at the eyepiece could heat it up to hundreds of degrees and, and shatter it, and you get bits of glass in your eyes. So there's another way to blind yourself. Anyhow, there are safe ways of looking uh, or observing things on the sun and observing solar phenomena, whether it's a transit or an eclipse. So we've just gone through a few there, and there are also lots of resources on the uh, on the the internet that will be able to help you with that. So now to the transit. So what's it going to be, and when's it going to be? So it's, so the transit of Mercury, which is when Mercury, the innermost planet, is going to go across the face of the sun as seen from the Earth. So for Australia, we're going to miss out, unfortunately. Our friends across the ditch in New Zealand are going to see it, and that'll be on the morning of November uh, November the twelfth. 
Now, for our North American listeners, uh, the ditch is the same as the pond when referring to England. That's right. So we, we say the ditch, which means the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand. So for our listeners in North America, you you will be able to see the, the transit of Mercury. You'll be able to see the whole thing. Our Kiwi friends will only see the last bit because the sun and Mercury will be below the horizon when the uh, event begins. But for, for part of North America, that sort of east coast of North America, you'll be able to see the whole event. And that will be on um, the afternoon of November the 11th for you and your local Remembrance time. Day. Rem- yeah, Armistice Day, Remembrance Day, exactly, yeah, yeah. Again, look up the internet or grab a copy of Australian Sky and Telescope. We've got all the details about that in there. And I know we're only talking about November at the moment, but uh, we've also, in, in the magazine, we also talk about a partial solar eclipse that's coming up uh, the next month, December 26th for uh, people in the Australian region. Why is it the transits of Mercury are so much more common than the transits of Venus? Uh, Mercury whizzes around the sun much, much quicker than Venus does. Mercury is, if you if you look at the inner solar system, you've got the sun, then you've got Mercury, Venus and, and Earth. It's and, an 88 Earth day orbit for Mercury, isn't it? Yeah, it's very, very quick. And, and Merc- the, the distances between the sun and Mercury and then Mercury, Venus and Venus and Earth are roughly the, roughly the same, sort of broken into thirds. So Mercury whizzes around the sun much, much quicker than Venus does. So we tend to get uh, Mercury going in front of the sun much more often than we do with Venus. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And you're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have spotted what could well be the smallest dwarf planet in our solar system. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy claims the object, Hygiea, is the fourth largest body in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, outsized only by the dwarf planet Ceres and the asteroids Vesta and Pallas. Using high-resolution observations from the European Southern Observatory's Sphere instrument on the Very Large Telescope in Chile, astronomers have determined Hygiea's shape and size, finding it to be practically spherical. To be classified as a dwarf planet, a celestial body must firstly orbit the Sun and not be a moon orbiting another planet. But unlike a planet, it must not have cleared out the neighbourhood around its orbit. And, and this is important for this classification, it must be self-gravitating, with enough mass to have pulled itself into a spherical shape. It was this final requirement which has been revealed about each year by the VLT observations. If approved by the International Astronomical Union, the decision would see Hygiea take the crown from Ceres as the smallest dwarf planet in the solar system. The study's lead author, Pierre Varenza from the Astrophysics Laboratory of Marseille, says Sphere's unique capabilities were able to resolve Hygiea's shape, finding it to be nearly spherical. The authors also use Sphere's observations to constrain Hygiea's size, putting its diameter at just over 430 kilometres. Now, by comparison, the solar system's most famous dwarf planet, Pluto, has a diameter of close to 2,400 kilometres, while the current record holder for the smallest dwarf planet, Ceres, is around 950 kilometres in size. Surprisingly, the observations also revealed that Hygiea lacks any large impact craters, which is unusual because it's the main member of one of the largest asteroid families, with close to 7,000 members that are thought to all have originated from the same parent body. Now, normally you'd expect that the collision event which led to the formation of such a large family of asteroids would have left a really nasty big crater scarring Hygiea's surface. But although astronomers have now observed Hygiea's surface with some 95% coverage, they could only identify two rather unambiguous craters, neither of which could have caused the impact which formed the Hygiea family of asteroids. Numerical simulations suggest the event which caused the breakup of the Hygiea progenitor would have involved a major head-on collision with a large impactor somewhere between 75 and 150 kilometres wide. That violent impact is thought to have occurred around 2 billion years ago, completely shattering the parent body. And once the leftover pieces reassembled, they gave Hygiea its rounded shape as well as its thousands of companion asteroids. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. We're looking uh, at some work that's been done through the Very Large Telescope and uh, they have discovered, um, well, they haven't discovered this dwarf planet, but they have probably confirmed that it is indeed a dwarf planet because I suppose they've been trying to figure that out for a little while. That's right. I think this is a really nice story. And what it highlights is the capabilities of the Very Large Telescope, which you'll remember is actually not one, but four telescopes, each with an 8.2 metre diameter mirror sitting on a mountain in Chile called Cerro Paranal, operated by the European Southern Observatory. And they they are 
you know, if not the, certainly among the finest uh, equipped telescopes in the world, certainly uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So the VLT, one of them, one of those four telescopes is equipped with an instrument called Sphere. And Sphere is relatively new instrument specifically designed for looking in detail at things a long way away. <laughs> you know, in other words, doing fine resolution imaging. So SPHERE is actually an acronym, as you might expect. And the acronym kind of tells you what it's for. It stands for Spectropolarimetric High Contrast Exoplanet Research. They're just making that up. Of course they are. That's what you do with acronyms. You, you can think of a nice word and then fit you. <laughs> fit your other words to it. <laughs> I used to do it myself. Oh, dear. I used to build instruments. What does spectropolarimetric metric mean? It means you're looking at the polarisation of the light coming from the target object. And polarisation is something we're familiar with if you use polarising sunglasses. You eliminate some of the vibrations that the light waves themselves participate in. So you're eliminating half of that. It actually is a very powerful tool in astronomy. Polarisation can tell you about dust in space. It can tell you about the way light has been affected by its passage through other media. And it's a generally useful thing. In this case, it's combined with spectroscopy, which is the breaking up of the light into its rainbow colours. So spectropolarimetric is a very capable analytical tool. But the main thing about sphere is that it's used in conjunction with what are called adaptive optics. And adaptive optics use flexible mirror technology coupled with some very sensitive devices in order to eliminate the distorting effect of the Earth's atmosphere. As light comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it's affected by pockets of hotter and warmer and colder air, and that basically blurs the image. But with clever technology, you can actually sense that distortion. And a little bit like you sense the ambient noise in a pair of noise-cancelling headphones. You sense the ambient noise and then put an inverse signal in that cancels it out. It's very much the same sort of thing, but you're doing it with light. Mm. Uh, and adaptive optics technology basically removes to a large extent, not completely, but to a large extent, it, it removes the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. So you can get very sharp imaging. In fact, you can make it comparable with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is above the atmosphere altogether. I have to say the ground-based telescopes like the VLT are very much cheaper to run than a space telescope. OK, so that's the backstory. But Especially sphere, if you can put it on the top of a mountain that exceeds, um, you know, someone's ability to breathe properly. <laughs> Yeah, it's not actually, um, Cerro Paranal is not quite that high. It's, oh, okay. uh, if I remember rightly, it's about 3,000 3, metres, which is a lot more amenable than the 4,200 metres, which is uh, at Mauna Kea, where, the, okay. where another suite of telescopes are in Hawaii. You and I have both been there. Hmm. I bet you haven't been to Paranal, though. I have. No, <laughs> I have not. Yes, sorry, that's just a bit of bragging there. So, OK, uh, ESO astronomers, and in particular, I think uh, it's a group, if I remember rightly, it is from the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Marseille, which is in France, if you can decipher my horrible French accent, researchers based there who have used this instrument to look at one of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, the, the main belt of asteroids between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And they found that one of them, the fourth biggest of the asteroids, whose name is Hygeia, or Hygeia, I suppose it should be, depending on how you pronounce it. It looks like Hygeia. That's what I thought it said. Hygeia is probably how it's pronounced. Depends on whether you lengthen your Ys or not in, in ancient Greek. Anyway, the bottom line is this thing is round. It's a, more or less a, a, a spherical shape, not a perfect sphere, but very close to it. And for an object like Hygeia, for it to be spherical means that it qualifies as being a dwarf planet, because one of the requirements for an object to be a dwarf planet is that it is... Uh, well, it's been pulled into a spherical shape by its own gravity. Right. The technical term is differentiated. It means that the, you know, the inside stuff has been graduated, if I can put it that way, by gravity. And what you end up with is a sphere. And so, and it is, when you look at the images that we've seen from ESO, the European Southern Observatory, there's this very distinctly round looking object. So it will be the International Astronomical Union, that august body, sometimes known as the 
the uber nerds uh, because they, <laughs> above all the rest of us nerds, they will look at the evidence for Hygea being a, uh, being a, a dwarf planet and they'll, they'll take a vote on it. And once they've done that, we might have an announcement that says here is the smallest of all the dwarf planets in the solar system because it's only 430 kilometres. Yeah, that's not big at all, is it really? It's not big at all. No, that's right. And it's very near the limit below which things don't have enough gravity to make themselves spherical. Mm. So it's a threshold object. Oh, that's a very nice way of putting it. It is. There are moons of some of the outer planets, uh, particularly I'm thinking of moons of Saturn, which we know very well thanks to the Cassini mission. Some of those moons are actually spherical, and they're not that much bigger than Hygeia is. But I think the asteroid counts, certainly because it's in orbit around the sun rather than being in orbit around another another object. Uh, it is a planet, um, but a dwarf planet because of its, uh, its small size. Actually, I suppose, I suppose finding all these objects and confirming them as dwarf planets um, does, in fact, uh, justify the decision to put Pluto in that category. When we thought for so long that it was the only one, now we know yeah. that that's not the case. Exactly. That's right. I agree with what you said wholeheartedly. Not everybody does. Uh, many people think Pluto is a special case. But if you make it a special case, then where do you draw the line? Yes, you know? precisely. Uh, the other weird thing about uh, Hygeia is that it is seemingly unblemished. Yes, that's right. Everybody expected it would be, you know, would have big craters on it because there's a thinking that it was once probably uh, involved in a collision with uh, with other objects. And that's because we think there's debris from that collision still in the asteroid belt. But no, it's got a few vague looking markings on it, but it's not pockmarked by huge craters, which some of the moons of, for example, one of the moons of Saturn has. It looks like the Death Star because you've got this enormous crater on one side. Yes. And, and likewise, um, uh, Phobos, which is the bigger moon of Mars, that's got a, a big crater in it too. I think one of those strange markings on Hygeia is a circle with a cross in it, Fred. <laughs> Gosh, you're right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Well, I can see a face in it too, so <laughs> work that one out. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A pilot flying at 35,000 feet over the Gulf of Mexico has managed to capture a rare video of an upward shooting lightning bolt known as a gigantic jet. The massive blue bolt burst out of the top of a passing thunderstorm, the huge filament reaching skywards into the ionosphere. The pilot's video is important because it contradicts previous hypotheses that suggested that gigantic jets could only reach their extreme heights if their streamers got a boost from the lightning leader. But this new vision shows the gigantic jet reaching the ionosphere well before the white-hot lightning leader leaves the cloud. This suggests a far more powerful electrical configuration than previously thought exists inside the thunderstorm, perhaps as much as 200 million volts. Gigantic jets are part of a little understood group of mysterious lightning phenomena known as sprites, blue jets and elves, which are seen to occur above the tops of thunderstorm clouds. Sprites are transient vertical column-like plasma structures, flashing high into the Earth's atmosphere, often in reddish clusters at altitudes of 50 to 90 kilometres. They're thought to be large-scale electrical discharges triggered by rare positive lightning that originates in the anvil head of the thundercloud, where positive charges tend to accumulate. Positive lightning is around five times more powerful and hot than the regular type of lightning normally seen, which is technically known as negative lightning. Positive lightning also lasts about ten times longer, allowing it to strike many kilometres away from a storm, which led to the famous expression, a bolt out of the blue. And unlike negative lightning, which occurs either inside the thunderstorm cloud or from the base of the cloud to the ground, positive lightning travels outside the cloud, striking the ground directly. Sprites are sometimes preceded by red halo emissions, lighting up a millisecond before the sprite, about 70 kilometres above the initiating lightning strike. These sprite halos are incredibly spectacular, looking like 50 kilometre wide disks. They're thought to be produced by weaker versions of the same ionisation process which is producing the sprites. 
Just as spectacular are elves, flattened, expanding reddish glows of plasma some 400 kilometres wide, but lasting just a millisecond, which have been seen at altitudes as high as 100 kilometres above thunderstorms. But they're thought to have a very different cause, the excitation of nitrogen molecules due to collisions between electrons being energised by the lightning from the underlying storm. Another close relative of sprites are known as blue jets. These are very bright narrow cones of plasma seen above thunderstorms at altitudes of 40 to 50 kilometres. Their colours believed to be caused by blue and the ultraviolet emissions from neutral and ionised molecular nitrogen. Blue jets are also thought to be associated with strong hail activity during thunderstorms. Another closely related phenomena are blue starters, which are thought to be shorter versions of blue jets, only reaching about 20 kilometres in height. Gigantic jets, such as that imaged over the Gulf of Mexico, are thought to be bigger versions of blue jets. This is space time, still to come. Smoking, now costing the Australian community more than $137 million a year. And good news if you're a coffee drinker. All that and more, still to come on Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists have released the findings of a major investigation showing how multinational fossil fuel corporations have for decades funded efforts to deceive the public about the true dangers of coal, gas and other hydrocarbons in causing climate change. The report, titled America Misled, How the Fossil Fuel Industry Deliberately Misled Americans About Climate Change, has been published by the University of Bristol. It summarises more than a decade of peer-reviewed scientific research. The report includes what the fossil fuel industry knew compared to what they actually did, the arguments they used to see doubt in the public's mind, the techniques they used to create those arguments, and some strategies for combating them. The study found internal corporate documents showing that the fossil fuel industry had known about human-caused climate change for decades, and that its response was to actively arrange and fund denial and disinformation campaigns designed to suppress any action and protect its status quo business operations. Researchers also found that as the scientific consensus on climate change emerged and strengthened, the fossil fuel industry, its political allies and paid journalists focused on attacking the consensus and exaggerating any uncertainties. The study also shows that the fossil fuel industries offered no real consistent alternative explanation for why the climate's changing, the goal merely to undermine support for action. Scientists found that the strategy, tactics, arguments and techniques used by the hydrocarbon industry and their supporters to challenge the scientific evidence of anthropogenic climate change includes cherry-picking anomalous and often inaccurate data, using fake experts to spread disinformation and resorting to conspiracy theories if all else fails. The study also found the fossil fuel industry's tactics are directly based on the tactics employed by the tobacco industry when they were trying to deny the link between nicotine and cancer. A study of over a million kids has confirmed previous research, suggesting that the youngest kids in a school class were some 1.4 times more likely to be diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, compared to the oldest kids in the same grade. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, also showed that the youngest children were some 1.3 times more likely to be diagnosed with an intellectual disability. And it doesn't end there. Being the youngest in your class also means you have a 1 in 200 chance of being diagnosed with depression. A new report warns that smoking is now costing the Australian community almost $137 billion a year. The findings by the National Drug Research Institute also showed that the economic and social costs of tobacco was directly responsible for some $19.2 billion in direct tangible costs in the 2015-2016 financial year, while the intangible costs were estimated at a massive $117.7 billion. The new research is the first national update in 15 years on the costs of smoking in Australia. Meanwhile, an editorial in the British Medical Journal says filtered cigarettes should be banned because filters don't make smoking any safer and trillions of butts are discarded globally every year, adding to the worsening problem of plastic pollution. The authors found that cigarette filters are made from a non-biodegradable plastic called cellulose acetate and so should be banned along with other single-use plastics such as straws. Archaeologists have uncovered an ancient walkway thought to have been used by pilgrims as they made their way to worship at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. 
The discovery, reported in the Journal of the Institute of Archaeology, was made in the city of David in the Jerusalem Walls National Park. Scientists with the Tel Aviv University found more than a hundred coins buried beneath paving stones dating back some 2,000 years, suggesting that the street was commissioned by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. The walkway ascends from the Pool of Siloam in the south up to the Temple Mount. Both monuments are highly significant to followers of the Judeo-Christian religion. The Temple Mount, located in the old city of Jerusalem, has been venerated as a Jewish holy site for thousands of years. At the time of the street's construction, it's where Jesus is said to have cured a man's blindness by sending him to wash in the Siloam pool. The 600-metre-long, 8-metre-wide pathway was paved with large, finely carved limestone slabs and featured ornate furnishings including a step podium, all said to be strong evidence that the street acted as a pilgrim route. Drinking coffee might keep you up at night, but new research does provide a reason to sleep a little easier, knowing that the popular beverage isn't as bad for your arteries as some previous studies had suggested. The research by the British Heart Foundation found that drinking coffee, including people who drank up to 25 cups a day, is not associated with having stiffer arteries. The study involved some 8,412 people using MRI heart scans and infrared pulse wave tests. Scientists found that moderate and heavy coffee drinkers were most likely to be male, smoke and consume alcohol regularly. The research also found that the average intake amongst the highest coffee consumption group was around 5 cups a day. Clearly they didn't investigate any of the broadcast newsrooms I worked in. The National Health and Medical Research Council has released an unfinished draft report of an overview of systematic reviews of homeopathy that was started in 2012 as part of a homeopathy review but never completed. The existence and non-release of the draft report had been the foundation for numerous conspiracy theories made by the pro-homeopathy community, including a submission to the Commonwealth Ombudsman by various homeopathy and CAM groups asking for its release. The conspiracy theories suggest that the draft report contained proof of homeopathy's effectiveness. However, Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the draft report actually highlighted concerns about the way numerous studies were being conducted. Five years ago, the National Health and Medical Research Council, the NH and MRC, just to make it easier to say, issued their report on homeopathy in which they came down and they said there's nothing there. There's no evidence to support it. It was a meta-study which they looked at all the reports, the other studies that had been going on and they assessed them and looked at those that had good evidence and, and decent numbers of subjects in their tests, etc. And they amalgamate, amalgamated all the results and this is what they came down with their judgment, which really hurt the homeopathy industry globally. They fronted them out when you mentioned the NH and MRC. It's actually, probably this report got more coverage outside of Australia than it did within Australia. And of course, the NH and MRC is the major funder of medical research in Australia. And you'll find groups in the UK and Europe, across Europe, who are constantly talking about this NH and MRC report, and they'll claim it was fixed. And they came up with the theory that uh, an earlier draft report done a few years before actually found that homeopathy was true, and therefore they decided to cover it up and do out this second report which they published. Now, homeopathy groups in Australia and overseas put in a campaign to the Commonwealth Ombudsman in Australia to try and get this first draft released. There was campaigns constantly overseas saying it's going to be released any second, it's going to show that you know the whole thing was a hoax, but the, the report was a hoax. And finally, the NH and MRC looks like they got, they got the jack of that and they said, oh, OK, here it is. And they issued the, the draft report with a lot of commentary um, you know, so it's annotated and basically said the reason we didn't release it was one, it was really early stage anyway it was just very sort of light touch things and it had a lot of weird shonky research in it and um, that's, they said they put it out now, you can have a look at it and you realise that the reason it was not released was because it's very early stage very light on and there were some sort of problems with the actual research activity not because it was finding out that homeopathy was true but because it was just bad research and so therefore you know, the, the methodology that was used to either carry out these research or to assess the research was poor. So they finally released this and we haven't really heard much from the homeopathy community since it was released. So it's sort of, especially overseas, as I said, the NH and MRC report one and two have not raised a lot of excitement here in Australia. I don't know why. Homeopathy is here as well. But in Europe, of course, homeopathy is huge. The National Health Service in the UK was supporting homeopathy and the sceptical groups over there have got that stopped because homeopathy here has been wiped off the insurance funds. What they can cover in Australia, although that's been challenged in some areas. Canada's cracked down on it. Germany is a st- the stronghold, and if they can crack down on it there, it's really going to be on its last legs, and justifiably so, because it's a total pseudoscience. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics.
And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from spacetimewithstuartgary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 